It's really a personal uh, pleasure and honor for me to introduce Dr. Jeffrey Taven. I mean, we hope you'll join me in giving him a warm class say well. Jokes, and I got a phone call out of nowhere 
from one of my climbing heroes saying, do you want to come and be part of the first American team to try and climb the east face of Mount Everest? It's fully sponsored by ABC Television Sports and National Geographic, and you'll be paid a year's tuition of medical school to go. Do you want to go? And I went, oh, yeah, yes, I can do it. So I got all excited and I applied for a leave of absence to go to yes, sorry. I applied for a leave of absence to uh, to uh, go climb uh, the East Face of Mount Everest. And I got a phone call from a guy. Some of the older ophthalmologists might know um, might know his name. And the guy called me on the phone and said, This is Jeff Taven. I said, Yes. And he said, You're an idiot. And I said, excuse me? He said, yeah, you're a complete moron. I think you're probably the dumbest person ever accepted to this institution. And I said, who is this? And he said, my name is Professor Mike Weedman, and I'm on a committee looking at leaves of absence from medical school, and there's no chance, zero, none, less than that, that you would ever get a leave of absence to go climbing. But anybody with half the intelligence to get into this medical school should know that if you apply to do research, Harvard will give you credit. And I happen to be an ophthalmologist interested in the question of whether high-altitude retinal hemorrhaging can be used as a prognosticator of high-altitude cerebral edema. And I've taken the liberty of ripping up your application for a leave of absence. And why don't we have dinner tomorrow tonight to discuss our research project? <laughs> well, this is my research team. <laughs> and actually, my, my research consisted of he, I had a, a non-dilated, a camera that took a picture of the retina through a non-dilated pupil that had just been developed. And my research basically consisted of taking a photograph of everybody's retina before the expedition, a photograph of everybody's retina during the expedition, and then a photograph of everybody's retina after the expedition. So three sets of photographs, three months credited at Harvard Medical School. And I finished medical school. And I was thinking of how I would get involved in international medicine and what to do. I was um, thinking that I probably would go back and do a degree in public health. And Mr. Edmund Hillary was the kind of honorary chairman of our trip to the East Face of Everest in 83. And he ran a foundation called the Himalayan Foundation in Nepal. And he's been one of my heroes. That, so much for his climbing, which in addition to Everest, he climbed quite a few other unclimbed peaks. He was the first person to go to both the North Pole and the South Pole. But it's really for what he gave back to the local people, building schools, building hospitals. And uh, after our Everest trip, I worked at his hospital that he built in a town called Fatlou. And it was uh, very, very challenging. I saw a lot of things that would be so easy to take care of in America or the Western world that were very difficult. Most of the problems I was facing were public health issues, problems of clean water, basic vaccinations. I saw children who would come in dehydrated, terrible diarrhea. I would rehydrate them, give them antibiotics, they'd go home, and three weeks later the same child would come in just as sick. And I watched children die. And I was just on the verge of going back to uh, uh, earned a degree in public health when I saw a Dutch team come to do cataract surgery. And uh, I really wasn't, you know, medical school exposed to people who were completely blind from treatable causes. And this is what a cataract looks like in the developing world. And in Nepal, it was just accepted that you get old, your hair turns white, your eye turns white, and then you die. And a Nepali expression for a blind person is a mouth with no hands. And when you're in a subsistence agrarian economy and you have a mouth with no hands, it's a huge burden on the family, it's a huge burden on the people around you. People get depressed. And once you go blind, the life expectancy is about one third that of Asian health match peers. And for children, it's a lot worse. And I watched this Dutch team come in and do cataract surgery with lens implants. It was a, it's a miracle. It was amazing. It's just like the movie you saw. I mean, people were just so excited and the joy and the changes and people just sort of blossoming back to life. I said, wow, this is something I would love to do. I looked and checked and found there was no one, zero, in Nepal, a country of 24 million at the time, doing cataract surgery with lens implants. I thought, wow, this is something I could really do. This is something I could do for my career. 
And I came back to the States, and I, it, was, it was amazing. I decided I wanted to do ophthalmology in April. And I came back to the States, and I, Dr. Weedman had wanted me to go into ophthalmology to begin with. And um, I called him and said, you know, I made a mistake. You're right. I should have gone into ophthalmology. And uh, we had published our high-altitude retinopathy studies in ophthalmology. We'd been presented at the American Academy of Ophthalmology. We sort of milked it for quite a bit. We had three or four papers from <laughs> high-altitude retinopathy. And uh, Dr. Weedman said, well, there's a residency position open that's just opened up out of the match at Brown, PGY2. Um, I'm going to get you the job, but if you quit, I'll kill you. And uh, so I actually flew to uh, Providence and interviewed in May, and uh, that July I started in ophthalmology. And I had to figure out how I was going to get involved in international ophthalmology. You know, what are you going to do? So I have our table of residence. And you know, how, how do you get involved? What do you do? And I, uh, I was a second year resident. I was investigating American programs. I was considering doing the Orpus Fellowship, which is a, a flying eye hospital that uh, flies into different countries and uh, teaches on the plane and demonstrates eye surgery. There were several other programs, uh, Sea International, that were really doing sort of short term trips. But the one person who really impressed me was an Australian doctor named Fred Hollis. And this was still, uh, this was in the early 90s. And by that time, lens implants were absolutely what was done everywhere in the developed world. But in Asia and Africa, aphakic surgery, you just take out the whole lens and you have these thick Coke bottle-like glasses, was still the main surgery that was done. It's the only surgery done in Nepal with the main surgery done in Africa, the main surgery done in India. And I went to, uh, I was at a meeting in San Francisco on international eye care, and I went to as a second year resident. Everyone was discussing what to do, and it was chairs in the ophthalmologist room with my woman, uh, Carol Kupfer was the chairman of it, and they were holding up Merval Christie as the model of what should be done for developing world. Merval Christie spent his entire career in Tixilla, Pakistan, doing an incredible number of uh, intracapsular cataract surgeries and very, very high quality for intracapsular surgery and giving you fake glasses. And they all made this resolution. They were going to try to figure out a way to increase aphakic surgery around the world. And in the midst of this, this guy pounds his fist down and screams, you wouldn't have that surgery. You wouldn't let your mother have that surgery. I don't want to deal with shits like you. And he walked out. And I went, whoa, who was that guy? And I said, oh, well, that's Professor Fred Hollis from Sydney, Australia. And what I didn't know when I was in Nepal was that Fred had, one, he was already raising money to build a lens factory to make the first inexpensive interocular lenses in Nepal. But he also had uh, Sandik Ruit, who was the uh, uh, best trained Nepali ophthalmologist and sort of my big brother, mentor, and really the brains behind anything I've done. Um, any, anything I've accomplished, really, I'm sort of the fat boy who plays because I bring the ball. And Dr. Louis really is the uh, star player. And he was living in Sydney with Fred Hollis at the time. And uh, I became corresponding with Professor Hollis. And unfortunately, he developed uh, cancer and died uh, just before I came over to work with him. But I, did my corneal fellowship in Australia under Hugh Taylor, who was uh, one of Fred's protégés, and was already, by the time I went there, the sort of world's expert on both onchocerciasis and trachoma. So I came in and did my fellowship uh, with uh, Hugh Taylor, and one of the things he did is, in my fellowship, was send me over to work with uh, Dr. Ruit. And I came over thinking I might have something to teach that uh, you know, I had all these sort of fancy training in the West, and I was just absolutely blown away. Because Dr. Reed already developed an amazing system. And it's not just the surgery, but the whole system of ophthalmic technicians, ophthalmic assistants, ophthalmic nurses, and the way he developed the flow. And we went on a remote, uh, I went to a remote eye camp, and we walked in for four days with pack animals to a remote area. And, uh, 
we had all patients who had these white absolute cataracts, everyone was light perception or hand motions, vision, with good pupillary responses. And we already developed a system of sterilization, copious use of beta 9 that brought the infection rate down to about one per 1,500 cases. We're in these really remote areas. We sterilized a little schoolhouse. And for three days, we worked side by side on these absolute white cataracts. And in three days, we did 224 cataract surgeries. Fred Hollows Interocular Lens Factory had just opened in Kathmandu, manufacturing these lenses for $4.50. And prior to that, the least expensive lens on the world market was about 200 and uh, as I said, in three days we did 224 surgeries, which sounds semi-impressive. Two doctors, three days, 224 surgeries, until you get the breakdown that Dr. Rui did 201, while I did 23. <laughs> and what was more, out of my 23 cases, I had to call Dr. Rui over to my table to help me at least 10 times. <laughs> and I, I just hadn't operated on Keverex like that. Um, Previously, but it was just amazing. And, you know, every morning it was it's like the movies. So it was it was this, like a religious revival meeting, and just the joy and the joy of the people, the families. And I said, Dr. Louis, I want to come back and work with you when I finish my fellowship. Well, I came back after my fellowship and went to work with Dr. Louis full time. And I was all enthusiastic. I wanted to learn his technique of not just the surgery, but really the overall delivery system and his model. And actually, those of you who will get the book Blind Corner, I mean, Second Sons, um, one thing I found out in the book was I was uh, working with Dr. Wheat for a couple of months in Kathmandu, and then he said, okay, well, I want you to go down to Bharatnagar. It's a population of about 2 million. There's one ophthalmologist. I want you to work in Bharatnagar. And it just happened that was just before the start of the monsoon. And Bharatnagar is contiguous with India. The temperatures just before the monsoon are sort of in the 105 to 110 degree range with uh, really heavy humidity and lots and lots of mosquitoes. And I thought Dr. Reed sent me there because he said that was where we really need someone to work in ophthalmology. What I found out from the book was he sent me there to get rid of me. And in Nepal, they're a very non-confrontational culture. And he couldn't really say, you know, you're, you're, you're working too hard, you're annoying, go away. He uh, sent me to Bharatnagar. And I ended up spending four months working in Bharatnagar and working through all the hospitals in southern Nepal teaching uh, cataract surgery with lens implants. And uh, when I was still there four months later, Dr. Ruit was uh, had been invited by the Chinese government to do the first cataract uh, training trip in Tibet, and he brought me to Tibet, and uh, that's where our friendship really started to develop. And so Dr. Reed and I, together, sort of, we formed what we called the Himalayan Cataract Project, and that was because at the time, Dr. Reed had by then taught two other doctors to do cataracts with lens implants, and that was what I started doing. But Nepal had an estimated backlog of 200,000 people blind with cataracts. And there were 60,000 new people going blind a year, and only about five doctors doing cataract surgery with lens implants. No one was doing cataract surgery in Tibet, no one in Bhutan, no one in uh, what was formerly Sikkim in um, the Indian Himalaya. And so we thought we'd call it the Himalayan Cataract Project because it would take us a lifetime to get a handle on cataracts in the Himalayas. And our focus was really to try and eradicate the blindness through creating the infrastructure and through teaching and uh, developing the skills at all levels. And the whole focus really at the time was training doctors to do better cataract surgery, but also training better assistants, better staff, trying to stretch the skills of doctors. We, Dr. Lee developed a three-year curriculum to train ophthalmic technicians after high school, a one-year program to develop ophthalmic assistants after eighth grade, a one-year program after nursing school to train ophthalmic nurses. And then we started taking some of our best young cataract surgeons and sending them either to Australia or to America for subspecialty fellowships. And then once we had the full uh, spectrum of subspecialists, we started a full residency program. We use a high-volume cataract programs as a training teaching model so that 
learning doctors in the course of a high volume cataract camp will often do 200 cataract surgeries in two weeks and under supervision. We have the established doctor doing the first eye and the training doctor doing the second. And what's really essential is really the team approach. In order to do a, a high volume program where a single doctor is doing more than 100 surgeries in a day, you need to have the patients perfectly prepared. You need to have really good people. Everyone gets you know, really good calculations for the lens implant and how to keep that straight. Everybody getting antibiotic drops, their eyelids washed, their eyelashes washed, perfectly prepared. We do them all with a block. So someone giving the uh, block, having a new sterile instrument tray for every, every single surgery. It really is, is a team approach where no one does anything that someone with lesser skills can do. So we don't have trained nurses putting in eye drops. We don't have trained ophthalmic assistants leading the blind patient from place to place. Unfortunately, Nepal is so good. I've actually trained, I've had seven corneal fellows, uh, six from Nepal and one from uh, Bhutan, and they're all better than me. And I'll come over and, and teach what I think is the latest, greatest thing that I'm doing. It'll take me an hour and a half, and I'll demonstrate it. And I'll come back six months later. They do what I do uh, in 45 minutes and better. And the cataract surgery now in Nepal is such high quality. And uh, you know, I'd be very comfortable with any of 20 ophthalmologists doing my own cataract surgery in Nepal. Well, again, thank you so much. I'll, I'll be hanging out for a while.